team from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight is a program of adventure with Howard Duff as your host. Here's a preview. The girl who was killed with him, you knew her as Vienna too? Yeah, Vienna too. <laughs> she wasn't very bright, actually. No. Can you believe such stupidity? An amateur working with a professional. A Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Howard Duff. Vienna is the capital of Austria, the capital of Schmaltz, and the home of Viennese pastry. It is also today the spy capital of the world. And if you're in that business, you'd better throw a look back over your shoulder once in a while to see what dreadful menace is stalking you. All of which makes Vienna sometimes a very dangerous place to be. The secret world of espionage is peopled with Americans, English, Germans from East and West, Russians, Bulgarians, Romanians, Czechs, you name it. And you can never be sure where their fanatical loyalties lie. In our story, some quite unknown force has picked up a quite unknown businessman from England, convinced that he's more than he seems to be. It's a very rough situation for him, because in this clandestine war of the spies, there are no holds barred. Yes, it's going to be very, very rough on him. And that's only the beginning of our story. Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of the Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Vienna 3 and 4, by Alan Caillou. Our stars, Ivor Berry and Antoinette Bauer. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. possibly be true that some people just shouldn't travel at all. Because if you're trouble prone, there's nothing like the safety of your own home. Do a scotch and soda, Mr. Carlson. No ice. Uh, thank you, stewardess. We must be getting very close now, I think. Yes, we are. Is this your first visit to Vienna, sir? Yes, the first time ever. And I'm convinced that every civilized man really ought to have spent his youth in Vienna. Or perhaps I should say, misspent it. <laughs> uh, a romantic city of wine, women, and song. Uh, I suppose it was quite a place in the old days. It still is, Mr. Carlson. Oh, I'm sure of it. But I'm not really much of a traveler, you know. More of a homebody. At my age, all a man wants to do is potter around the garden. I'm told it's the first sign of senility. <laughs> oh, come now. Not a day older than 60, you can't be. And nowadays, that's really quite young. 55, actually. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, it's not easy to recover from a full power like that, is it? I learned long ago that when you're, what, 20 years old or so, a full power is almost a juvenile prerogative. 27, actually. Oh. And that makes us even, doesn't it? <laughs> certainly does. Uh, will you tell me your name? I'm afraid it's Agnes. Agnes Brown. Afraid? But Agnes is a delightful name. It has a charming, old-fashioned sort of ring to it. Do you know what it means? Yes. It means I get to be called Aggie if I don't watch out. <laughs> <laughs> In Greek, it means pure and chaste. Are you pure and chaste, Agnes? Uh, not as pure as I used to be, but chased, yes, all over Vienna when I get there like any other stewardess. It's part of that romantic image. Well, isn't that nice? Mm, sometimes, yes. And uh, <clears throat> will you also tell me where you'll be staying in Vienna? They put the crew up at the Bismarck. The Bismarck? Well, I'll remember. And uh, Brown has to be either English or German, right? Uh, half and half, Mr. Carlson. Like your whiskey soda. And just as stimulating. And even more delectable. <laughs> Mr. Carlson? Mr. Carlson? You 
You are Mr. Carlson, aren't you? I am indeed, and you are... I'm Gilda Goster, Herr Schmidt's private secretary and uh, confidant. <laughs> Some people seem to have all the luck. But you're what? Uh, English? American? A kind of status symbol in this town, Mr. Carlson. Your bag? Oh, just my carry-on. Good. The only way to fly. The limousine is right here. Mm. Thank you, Hans. We'll go straight to the office, please. You won't, lady, of uh... Have you ever been to our lovely city before, Mr. Carlson? Um, no, I'm afraid not. But, um, my company wants to buy 30,000 of Herr Schmidt's dolls, and for such a large order, they thought I'd better come here myself. You know about these things, young lady? Of course. My whole life is tied up with dolls. <laughs> Mine used to be once, but I'm not as young as I used to be. Oh, come now. Not a day over 60. You can't be. I think I'll dye my hair. <laughs> Mr. Carlson, Herr Schmidt. Ah, my very dear Mr. Carlson, it's good to see you. I am Wilhelm Karl Leopold Schmidt. Was good to fly? Oh, thank you, yes, uh, very uh, good. Uh, next time is better to travel with Lufthansa, yes? <laughs> How are you liking our beautiful Wien? Wien? Vienna. Oh, uh, yes, uh, uh, very beautiful. Please, please, sitting down is more comfortable. Uh, thank you. Well, um, if we could get down to essentials right away. Um, my company, Mr. Schmidt, is interested in the purchase of 30,000 of your dolls, but well, the quoted price is, in our opinion, a little high. It's coming down. Two and a half percent under quotation. We thought about seven percent. It, it's really a very substantial order. It's still coming down. Three percent, but that is genug. The best dolls in all of Europe. Oh, please, there's no argument about quality. It's, it's all a matter of price. If you like, Mr. Carlson, I'll be happy to take you to our display room and show you how beautiful our Viennese dolls really are. Well, that sounds like... Um, uh, yes, a very sensible idea. <laughs> Excuse me, Herr Schmidt, but I must ask Mr. Carlson to come with us. Gott im Himmel, I have a pistol. In mine, Aburo? As you have so cleverly observed, he has a pistol in your office, three of them, in fact. And we must talk English, Herr Schmidt. Mr. Carlson affects not to speak German, though we are not quite sure about that. Then if you would be good enough to explain to me... In my card, Mr. Carlson, my authority. Commissioner Francis P. Earhart, uh, sick, uh, sick... Uh, sure, sure, me. Ah, the high dean's... But what would the Secret Service want here, Commissioner, with a naive and innocent English businessman who came here only to buy my dolls? Your naive and innocent English businessman, Herr Schmidt, is a spy working for the Americans and the friends, the English, whose only desire is the extermination of the working classes. I don't believe this. What working classes? I put in 60 hours and more a week of damned hard work. But I'm not working class in your jargon, is that it? And since when, Herr Commissioner, does the Secret Service worry about the working classes? You have seen my authority. You see, I have two men with me, also armed. And so, Mr. Carlson, you will come with me quietly or not quietly. The choice is yours. Very well. I am indeed, as Mr. Schmidt puts it so bluntly, a, a naive and innocent man. But not so naive that I will argue with guns pointed at my stomach. But first... I wish to call the British Consul. You can do that at headquarters. And my company in London. At headquarters. Mr. Schmidt, will you make those calls for me? I, I don't think I can trust this maniac. Maniac? Oh. Oh. I do not like to be called a maniac, Englander. Oh. I will make those calls, Mr. Carlson. And I have a friend in the police department. I'll call him, too. Well, it will not help you at all, Fräulein Garth. And don't call me Fräulein Garth. It's at times like this that I want to be called Miss Garth. I'll be the then, Nadius Fräulein. Herr Schmidt. I have a terrible feeling, Poopy. What feeling, Liebson? The commissioner's accent. It was not Austrian, it was Russian. Would there be a Russian in the Secret Service? Gott im Himmel! You mean... That's exactly what I mean. I think our poor Mr. Carlson has been kidnapped. <laughs> professional spies is a very ruthless world. 
These guys don't fool around because their own lives depend on that ruthlessness. Mistakes get made. Sure they do. But they only get made once. And a man can get killed just for saying no when he should be saying yes. It's as simple as that. No! No, no, no! The man you came to see, you tell me his name. You save yourself any trouble. I told you already! I told you why I came, why I came to Vienna. <laughs> Well, Sergeant Bulloff, does Mr. Carlson still insist on his cover story? Yes, Comrade Reutemann, he does. I have no, no cover story. Can't you, can't you believe that? You're a very stubborn man, Mr. Carlson. But we will find out what we need to know. There's nothing to find out. The word I've told you by now. This, this savage hit me. I went on hitting me and... I have told you long ago. Doesn't that make sense? In my whole life, I've never been hit in anger. Can't you understand? You have the wrong man. You will come with me now to another place where the questioning will be somewhat more... more serious. Come. Comrade Leutnant. What is it, Comrade Sergeant? If I may suggest, he should be handcuffed. He may be as dangerous as he is stubborn. I am armed, Sergeant. Let him run if he wishes. I am an excellent shot. Comrade Earhart. He knocked me down, ran along the corridor, and jumped through the window onto the street. Good, good. I heard you fire. You did not hit him. Of course not. I'm not a fool. Perhaps not all the time. You, your man? I have five men following him. As soon as they find out where his safe house is, we will learn who it is he came here to meet. We can assume, I suppose, that he will go to his safe house. Of course. Where else would he hide? Yes, Perhaps. I do not think there is any perhaps about it. He can hardly wander through the streets of Vienna in the condition he is in. And yet, you are quite sure, are you not, that we do have the right man? I am sure. Mm. Because if you have made the mistake, Comrade Leutnant, I'm afraid our superiors will take it very, very hard. I do not make mistakes, Comrade. Will that be all? You may go. Mr. Carlson. Yes, of course I remember you. Where are you? As a matter of fact, I'm downstairs in the lobby. I just happened to be walking down the street and there was the Hotel Bismarck. Like fate's bringing us together again. I wondered if I could, well, well come up and say hello. Well, that is a lovely idea. Are you alone? Not only alone, but lonely. Just sitting here all by myself and wondering how to pass the next few hours. Come on up. It will be lovely to see you again. I'll be right there. Well, Mr. Fred Carlson himself. Isn't that lucky? Lucky? No, not at all. And he was bound to turn up here sooner or later. And in our business, you're not supposed to believe in luck. If you plant the seeds correctly, they sprout. They always do. Once you, my darling Agnes, put the idea of a nice little clandestine affair into his mind, from that moment on, his coming here was inevitable. hotel bedroom. That's really not the way to behave. But then, it seems that Agnes is not quite as innocent as she appeared to be. So, perhaps it's all right. And you're sure this time, Harold, that you have the right man? Absolutely. You were absolutely sure the last time. 
with Vienna one and Vienna two. The kind of war we fight, Agnes, innocent bystanders do get hurt once in a while. Hurt? They were rather more than hurt. Okay, killed. Who cares? It happens. Now we have Vienna three, and this time, take my word for it, there's no mistake. I'll be in the closet. Coming. Uh, Mr. Carlson, good heavens. What happened? You look as though you've been run over by a steamroller. Come in, come in. Yes. Uh, I suppose I should apologize for coming to see you in this rather disreputable state. I do apologize. I found a public fountain and cleaned myself up a bit, but, well, I didn't want to go back to my own hotel just now. But what on earth happened? Wait, let me pour you a drink. Scotch and soda, no ice. But I think it will have to be a very strong one. <laughs> that sounds like a splendid idea. Well, I'm really not hurt, you know. It's all quite superficial. But do you think I could use your bathroom just to rinse my face a bit more? Of course, it's right there. Did you get into a fight or something? I, I know that Vienna can be quite trying these days, just like any other big city. Such a shame. Yes, it was one of those odd cases of mistaken identity. You really must tell me about it. Well, a bunch of people abducted me, I suppose that's the word. But I got away from them. But they seemed so sure that I was the man they wanted, I, I thought it might be wise to stay away from my own hotel for just a while. Here's your drink. Uh, thank you. Mm. Oh, that's really very good. <laughs> and so are you. <laughs> You're not only very attractive, but you've got a heart of gold. I think you're absolutely marvelous. And you are very, very sweet. Come. Come and sit down beside me and tell me all about it. What is it, Comrade Westman? We have news of the subject, Comrade Erhard. Ah, oh, good. Immediately after his escape, he found a public fountain on Cosmos Rasa and took the time to clean himself up a little, which I find presupposes a certain calm clarity of mind and right in keeping with his he character. He does the facts, comrade. Then he went to the Bismarck Hotel. He called from the lobby to room 178 and spoke for several minutes. The room is registered to whom? To a woman named Agnes Braun. One of the stewardesses on the airline. Was she working on the flight he arrived on? Yes, it seems that she was. Then Fräulein Brown is not his contact, because if they both left London together on the same plane, he would not have to fly all the way to Vienna to meet her there. That point did occur to me, comrade. And I examined the visitor's book at the hotel desk, and to my astonishment, I found that a man named Harold Cox is staying there. He arrived this morning shortly before Carlson's arrival. Cox. Cox. Harold Cox. Do we know him? Yes. Harold Cox is only one of his many names. He's American. He's 42 years old, and he has been for quite some time now one of the most successful spies in the business, a freelance. He buys and sells secrets from anybody to anybody. Ah, now that I find very interesting indeed. Yes, I thought you might. He's very successful, comrade, and he's quite ruthless. You know about the couple found dead on the glacier last week? I fancy I heard something about that. Yeah, the car that went out of control, a break in the steering mechanism. Yes, yes, I know. The police believe that it was this man, Harold Cox, who organized it. So they can't prove anything against him. I believe that too, because one of those people, the men, was an English spy code named Vienna Ron. We don't know who his girlfriend was. Neither of them had any papers, any papers at all. But Vienna Ron was believed to be carrying a complete and fully detailed list of every single American agent working in West Germany, more than a thousand of them. An immensely valuable piece of information. And it was known that Harold Cox was hoping to acquire it for resale. Perhaps he did that. 
He disappeared immediately after the so-called accident to the car. And perhaps he did not. You know, if he's back in Vienna so soon, uh, let me skip a few salient points and guess that he did not get it because Vienna 1 did not have it. So he returned to try again with Vienna 3. Or let me guess instead that he did get it and has come back to negotiate the sale. Only the Russians could afford the kind of price he would ask for a prize like that. It would be the sale of the century. No, don't cut me off. I'm waiting. Still waiting. Uh, where am I going to unload those 30,000 dolls if Herr Carlson has gone forever? Ach, to leave a 30,000 of them. First we find out if he has gone forever. Yes, I'm still here. Yes, that was the name on the card, Commissioner Francis T. Earhart. Well, thank you very much, Captain. No, I'm not free tonight. It's my ballet class. Good. And thank you. Well. Well? Commissioner Francis T. Earhart does not exist. Oh. Uh, now you have to telephone the British consul and to his firm in London. May that last one collect. Why don't we hold off on that for a while? Why? Poopy, that's what I ask you. Ach, Lipson, don't be so devious, please. You really are a very devious young lady. But nice. And I think I'll go out for a coffee. But what I don't understand, Freddy, is why you? I honestly don't know. I am not a particularly wealthy man. I don't even look particularly wealthy. But these terrorists, I suppose they were, though they couldn't be anything else, whisked me off to a house on the Graben, right behind the opera. And they were they were, were going to hold me for ransom. I got away from them. I, I, I did not want to go back to my hotel right away because obviously they thought I was somebody else. And I thought they might try again. But what all this means, Agnes, is... Could I perhaps lie low here for a while? In your room? Like, overnight? Freddy, I think that is a marvelous idea. Good evening, Mr. Carlson. Oh, God! Agnes, your, your, your husband hidden in a closet? But, sir, I assure you, I have absolutely no untoward intentions. I, I, I merely... Come off it, Freddy. You just blew the whole thing. I beg your pardon. I'm Harold Cox. I'm sure you must know the name. No, sir, I'm afraid not. And uh, I blew? Blew what? The whole caboodle. You told Agnes you'd never been to Vienna before, but yet you know the Graben is right behind the opera. Well, of course, I saw, I saw the street sign. I, I recognize the opera from its photographs. It's, it's one of the most famous buildings in the world. <laughs> it's a nice recovery. But then you spun a tale about terrorists holding you for ransom. Well, it so happens we have a double agent in that grabbing house working for us. And shortly before your arrival here, he phoned to tell us all about your escapade there. Escaped, he said, while under interrogation. Nothing at all about holding you for ransom. Okay. Try and get out of that one. <sighs> then I'll have to put my cards on the table, won't I? Yes. Why don't you, Freddy? You're right. They weren't terrorists at all. It was the Secret Service. They, they, they showed me a card. But I was afraid to tell Agnes that it was the police looking for me. I, I figured she wouldn't let me stay here. And I just, well, I just had to lie low for a bit until I could work things out. Call the British consul, perhaps, and ask his help. I just don't know. Help me, Mr. Cox, please. I'm desperate. <laughs> I have to tell you, Vienna 3, you're pretty good. Vienna 3? I don't understand. Hello? Who? I oh, yes. Yes. Okay, let's try another tack. Let's talk about money. I have half a million dollars in American money, a suitcase full, right in the closet there, to buy what you have to sell. And you won't get more than that, even from the Russians. I honestly do not understand. Yes, of course. Send them up, please. Thank you. Send who up? Not who, not even whom. Them. 
Somebody sent me some long-stemmed red roses. I can't think who it can possibly be. The skipper's not... Oh, Freddy. Was it you? Just a little gesture. Oh, you're sweet. Really sweet. Look, we're talking about the sale of the century. The hell with your damn roses. Okay, Carlson, and I'm still going to call you Vienna 3. Half a million in cash, tax-free. All you have to do is tell me where it's hidden. I know you've got it, and I want it. Agnes, please. Can't you convince him who I am? He's got the wrong man. Everybody's got the wrong man. Ah, my roses. How I love long-stemmed red roses. Oh, all right, back up. Back up, back up. I know how to use this gun. Don't move, Mr. Cox. I've got a very itchy finger. What have you got for me, Freddy? It seems I have a little windfall for us, Gilda. Half a million dollars. But first, uh, let me make the introductions. Mr. Harold Cox, whose name is well known to us, and Miss Agnes Brown, uh, just another name for the files. Agnes, Harold, allow me to present the Enna Four. Howard Duff again. And here's the concluding act of Vienna 3 and 4. I have to make one point, Mr. Cox, compared with which the rest is trivia. Uh, Gilda said, don't move, I know how to use this gun. Well, you'd better believe her. And you should also know that in this business, uh, being good just isn't enough. You have to be damned good. Especially if you're a freelance, as we both are. And you are not quite what you're cracked up to be. You were right about one thing, though. The Russians were not prepared to pay as much as half a million, which, coincidentally, perhaps, uh, was our asking price. <laughs> this is a heavy suitcase. Well, they beat us down to 350000 The deal was made in London by my late lamented predecessor, Vienna 1. He and his girlfriend, Vienna 2, came here ostensibly to make the delivery, but it was a blind, Mr. Cox, a decoy. We wanted to find out the nature of the opposition. They found out the hard way, didn't they? I have the delivery, Harold, a micro dot hidden under the label on a bottle of vodka, a little touch of whimsy to enlighten our lives. We always knew that our best customer would be the Russians. Well, now it's time to open this handsome piece of luggage. My, oh my. So that's what half a million dollars looks like. I don't know how you'll ever get out of here alive, Carlton. It's a pretty sure bet that Earhart is watching this place. You know who Earhart is? Oh, yes, of course. One of those nasty Eastern European groups. They must know you're here. They let you escape. You know that, too. So that they could follow you. Of course I know that. A foolish woman fired a pistol at me from a range of ten feet and missed. Even they aren't as incompetent as all that. So why don't you give me the pistol, Gilda, and take this suitcase full of money over to you-know-where. And I'll join you in a little while so that we can celebrate. Tonight we'll make the delivery to the Russians... Uh, pick up another 350000 and be on our way to uh, somewhere in South America. I'll come up against you again sometime, Vienna 3. And I promise you, next time it won't be so easy. Not true. We'll never meet again. And may I tell you why? I'm retiring from this business. Uh, let me tell you the why of that, too. And never stops talking, does he? A short while ago, I began to worry about the hazards of this business we're all in. I mean... Gilda can pop that little silenced pistol of hers with no regrets at all. And presto, no more Harold Cox, no more Agnes Brown. Or you can pull a fast one on me and no more Freddie Carlson or Gilda Garth. Yeah, you see what I mean? It's hazardous. So I did some research into the lives and deaths of our great fellow professionals, uh, starting with Marta Hari, executed at the age of 41... Then Wilhelm Cooper, murdered at the tender age of 29. Manitou Kraski, better than any of us, but captured and hanged at the age of 62. And I discovered that the average lifespan of a professional spy is 55 years, two months, and one week. And that happens 
to be my age almost precisely. It means, my friends, that I have to retire now to beat the average. And that is what I'm doing with a beautiful young woman and a nice little nest egg for my remaining years. Your silenced pistol, please, my darling. Here, take it. You may have to kill them both. You know that, don't you? Uh, no, I don't think so, my precious Gilda. Agnes is far too pretty to be found just lying in a pool of blood. What an undignified way to go. And Harold, well, in a strange sort of way, I rather like him. They are our kind of people, Gilda. Besides, it would lower the average alarmingly. I'd be living on borrowed time. No, we can't have that, can we? All right. Isn't it? No, don't worry. We'll find a way to smuggle it out. As soon as you're clear, I'll follow you. I'll wait for you, darling. Hmm. Well, why don't you pour us all a drink, Agnes? I'm sure it would go down very well just now. You know that she won't get past Earhart's men, don't you? And neither will you. We'll cut you both down in ten seconds flat. I told you, Harold, you are not as good as you're cracked up to be. It's not Gilda they're looking for here. They don't even know she exists. And it's not me either. Because after all this time, they just have to be convinced that we made a deal. It means, Harold, that by now they think you've got the merchandise and they'll be after your blood, not mine. The moment you leave the safety of this room, which is in itself perhaps illusory, they are going to grab you. They'll take you to the house on the Graben... And they'll start looking for the micro dot. It might be very rough for you. Why don't you tell them Agnes has it? Under all that sweetness and light, Agnes is a lot tougher than you are, you know. Cheers. Good health. <clears throat> and you're right. It's me they'll be after now. So Agnes will stay here and I'll leave alone. I'll elude them. Don't ask me how, because I don't know, but somehow. And if I don't, well, it'll lower that average you spoke of, won't it? Raise your quotient of borrowed time. I lost this gambit, didn't I? To say nothing of a half million dollars. West German money, they'll replace it for you. For them, it's peanuts. You know about the sewers in Vienna? The sewers? Well, they're pretty famous. I've heard of them, but I can't claim any intimate knowledge of them. Why? Take the elevator to the basement. Right behind the generator, there's a flight of steps that leads down to the sewers. Take it. Follow the main sewer for five or six hundred yards. Take any of the exits above your head, and you'll come up in the stud park. Earhart and his men will still be sitting watching the hotel for you to come out. Quite a way behind you. You're really a very nice guy, Vienna Three. No, not really. It's mostly for Agnes. She got to me somehow. Oh, Freddy. I keep telling you, you are so sweet. And that's not true either. Um, why did you kill Vienna One, Harold? Because I had to. You know what it's like in this business. He tricked me. The micro dot he sold me under the stamp of an envelope was supposed to contain 1,131 names. The names of every U.S. agent in West Germany. Would have been quite a haul, but it was blank. Nothing on it. So he had to die. We can't let them get away with this kind of thing. We have to teach them a lesson that other agents are going to remember. They have to say to themselves, don't cross Harold Cox. You're going to get killed. The girl who was killed with him, you knew her as Vienna too? Yeah, Vienna too. <laughs> she wasn't very bright, actually. No? Nah, <laughs> an amateur. She made the mistake of telling me they were driving up to the Alps immediately after our meeting. Can you believe such stupidity? An amateur working with a professional just took one phone call to get their steering rod cut halfway through. <laughs> For the rest, the rest, it was inevitable. <laughs> she really was very, very dumb. <laughs> Why? <laughs> she was my daughter, Cox. She was what? Goodbye, Cox. Don't die. Please don't die. I need you. Don't die. He did that already. Remember the way out, Agnes. They may be waiting for you, too. So you go through the sewers. Help. Help. Not 
not. Don't die. Please, don't die. The steps to the sewers are behind the generator in the basement, Agnes. Five, six, seven hundred yards. Just keep walking till you come to the manholes in the stud park. You'll elude them all. Earhart and his men. Good night, my dear. I'll be on my way now. <laughs> Theater has been brought to you by Sears, Roebuck, and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. Vienna 3 and 4 was written by Alan Caillou, produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Howard Duff. Our stars were Iber Barry and Antoinette Bauer. Featured in the cast were Sidney Swyer, Marvin Miller, Hans Conried, Peggy Weber, and Barney Phillips. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. Associate Director of Sears Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollison. Mark Trella is production supervisor. And the recording engineers are Joe Wachter and Hal McDonald. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Music 103, Cab FM, St. Louis, 24 hours a day. CBS News. President Carter is making some changes in his administration, and he's appointing a top aide to an even higher post. This is John Bohannon reporting on the CBS Radio Network. More on the new job at the White House from Leslie Stahl in Washington. As part of his Camp David domestic summit, President Carter is considering a major reorganization of the White House staff. The impetus came from a memo written by aide Hamilton Jordan on making the White House function more efficiently. And it's been learned that as a result, the president's decided to give Jordan the official title and all the responsibilities of White House chief of staff. One official said that in addition to a review of the administration's energy and economic policies, we've been looking at our own operation, too. That's something that's been going on parallel to the summit on energy. It's an opportunity, he said, to take stock of ourselves. Sources say that as part of his reorganization memo, Jordan recommended the firing or reassigning of some fairly high officials, including Energy Secretary James Fussinger. An official said... I haven't detected any indication from the president on that, one way or the other. Until now, the president was said to be firmly against firing Schlesinger. Leslie Stoll, CBS News, Washington. President Carter, top advisors and governors from eight states are at Camp David for a dinner meeting on energy and other issues. President Carter invited the governors of eight states to spend part of the weekend at Camp David in Maryland. They'll talk about gasoline shortages and other energy issues. Governor Ella Grasso of Connecticut says she has nothing new to say to Mr. Carter. Well, I won't tell the president again what I've told him before. That we're very concerned about the supplies of gasoline, the manner in which it is allocated to our various states, what's happening to price, and then our constant and gnawing problem of the increasing cost of home heating oil and its availability. Another invited guest, Governor Hugh Carey of New York, says he'll tell the president he must recognize that the country is at or near a national fuel emergency. A federal judge in Baltimore said no tonight to Maryland's request for a court order forcing the Department of Energy to give the state extra gasoline supplies. The judge said it took the federal government five years to devise the current allocation system, and he saw no reason to upset the plan now. The National Automobile Dealers Association and representatives of much of the oil industry are asking for the end to the federal gasoline allocation system. A joint statement says the system has caused the gasoline shortages and long lines at gas stations. The government released figures today showing good news for the economy. More jobs for white teenagers put the country's unemployment rate in June at a five-year low of 5.6%. And another report shows a drop in wholesale meat prices, which may mean some slight relief for the consumers this summer. Federal Aviation Administration mechanics will begin a new inspection system tomorrow on the engine mounts of DC-10 jetliners, and the FAA says it may require additional inspections and possible design changes before giving the okay for the jets to fly again. 
At Gamer's Confectionery Store in Butte, Montana, people have been on the honor system making their own change from a self-service cash register. It's been that way for 35 years. Owner Carl Rowan ordered 100 of the new Susan B. Anthony dollar coins this week, though. He says some of his customers apparently thought they were quarters. Rowan lost about $40. He says he'll keep using the new coins because he wants to be...